profit for the life to come. But if you believe the Bible, and you understand there is a life to come, we should be concerned about what profits in the life to come, and not just in the here and now. Bodily exercise has a little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things, the present and the future, having promised both this life and the life to come. Well, the third thing I want you to see is also a little more obscure. <coughs> Not only does Paul talk to Timothy about being a good minister and about being a godly minister, he tells him he's a guarded minister. Now, that word to me, conveys the idea of holding your cards close to your chest. Um, keeping things a mystery. Being guarded. You know, when somebody says, well, he acted a little guarded to me. Well, that means he's holding back something. He's not showing himself. That, that's not the way I'm using it in this, time, in this sense. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of it in terms of the fact that God is guarding him. God is protecting him. God is keeping him. And that's a safe place to be. And from that safe place, Timothy can do great exploits, can attempt great things for God. Uh, a couple of things I want you to see to underscore that idea of Timothy being a guarded minister. Notice in uh, verse 8, he says, Godliness has promise. It has promise for the life that is and for the life that is to come. It has promise. God has promises. God has promised us certain things. And we can count on Him. Notice verse 9. He says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. If that sounds familiar, it's because it's the same phrase Paul used in chapter 1, verse 15, when he said, uh, I'm chief among sinners. Um, Paul is saying that what God has said is trustworthy. What God has promised, you can bank on. Now, hold your place there and look at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1 for just a second. 2 Timothy 1 and verse 12. Paul again writing to Timothy a few years later, <coughs> but with the same two people in view, you can make a connection more easily, maybe. 2 Timothy 1 12. For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know that I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. And that's a verse you may have committed to memory at some point. It's a verse from which we get one of our old-time hymns in the hymn book. For I know whom I believe in and am persuaded that he is able... You know that one? To sing along. To keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Very good. Against that day. That's King James Version. Um... But that verse is very important uh, because Paul is saying, I trust that God is able to keep me. God is able to guard me. God is able to protect me until the day that all this comes to an end and Jesus consummates His kingdom. God is able to keep me. I am guarded by God. And he says, Timothy, you need to be a good minister and a godly minister, but you need to work from the understanding that you are a guarded minister. God has got your back. Notice what he says, uh, continuing in verse 10. For to this end, or because of this, we both labor and suffer reproach. Because, Timothy, you are a guarded minister, because you have God watching your back, because you are protected by God, because you are secure in God, you can do these two things. You can labor and you can suffer reproach. Now I'm going to comment on that in just a second. Uh, the word labor is a word that means to work hard until you're weary. Work hard until you're weary. <coughs> and the word that the New King James translates, suffer reproach, is the word agonizomai in Greek. It's uh, the word from which we get our word agonize, uh, the verb, or agony, the noun. And it's translated in most of our newer translations to strive. <coughs> So, for, to this end, we labor and strive. We work hard until weary. There are some people who have the impression that being a pastor is a pretty cushy job. And I must admit, when I first embarked upon this journey, I had no idea uh, the stresses 
that come with being a pastor. Now, granted, uh, we don't do a whole lot of heavy lifting. Okay? Uh, matter of fact, when we're even moving tables and chairs around the room, a lot of times we let you guys do that and we kind of supervise. Uh, not because we're too good for it. It's just, you know, too many cooks spoil the broth, so if, if it's under control, then let it be under control. And there's other, other fish to fry. But um, we don't do a whole lot of heavy lifting necessarily. But there's a lot of stress in being a pastor. Uh, preaching, you may not realize, is a very interactive experience. You don't think you contribute much, uh, probably, to my preaching, but you do without realizing it. Pastors have, um, have a, a heart burden to connect with their audience, to know that what they're saying is having an impact, it's having an effect, it's, it's achieving a desired result. And so, as I'm preaching, as Tim is preaching, we're constantly reading faces. We're watching body language. We're trying to figure out, are they getting it? That's why sometimes we have to preach for 45 or 50 minutes, because y'all just aren't getting it. <laughs> See? You knew I'd find a way to blame it on you, didn't you? <laughs> if y'all get it quicker, we'd be through soon. <laughs> But it's a very interactive experience, and, and we're thinking, even as we're talking, we're thinking, okay, if they're not getting it, how can I say that differently? What do I need to do to, to drive that point home? Uh, I've seen, I don't do this, but I've seen some uh, sermons or heard of some pastors who have their sermons written out and out in the margins, <coughs> thrust out hand here. <laughs> you know, things like, uh, I'm not talking about programming something like that. But I'm serious, it's an interactive experience. It's not like being a college professor. I remember when I was in high school, uh, one of my high school teachers told me, that when you get to college, she told the class, so when you get to college, you're not going to have teachers, you have professors. Now here's the difference. A teacher wants you to learn. A professor is paid to say what he knows. Whether you get it or not, he doesn't care. He gets paid to stand up there and tell you what he knows. He's just spouting off information. And I found that largely to be true when I was in college. Uh, much different than high school. Pra pastors aren't up here to just tell you what we know. And, you know, if you get it, fine. If you don't get it, fine. No, we're, we're vested. We want you to get this. Because God wants you to get this. God wants you to understand these things that we preach, that we explain from the Scripture week after week after week. It's a very interactive experience. And it's stressful. I learned in seminary, and I, I must confess, I, I kind of had <coughs> doubts about this at the time. One of my professors told us in class that a pastor who preaches a 20-minute sermon, when does that happen? Um, if he does it right and does it well, expends as much energy as somebody working an eight-hour day in some other kind of job. Like, mm, I don't know. But I've known of guys.